Well, I like, thank you for the introduction, by the way. I like to do things chronologically. So uh, let me start with, a, with an image, just to get a bit of a picture of me. Very soon you'll see. Finally, good. I like to start things chronologically. That is me a few years ago. Not that many, but a few years ago. Not much has changed, as you can see. But it's one of my favorite photos, so I always, I always like using it, you know, proof that at least sometimes in my life I was cute. <laughs> Maybe not that important. But what is a bit more important is that I was born in a family which is a little different. Everybody in my family but me has a disability. That means my parents, my sister, my nephew, everybody but me has a disability. Now, statistically, it makes no sense why it happened, but it did, and it had a big impact on me. I couldn't do the same things that probably you did with your parents or with your children. I know what hunger is, I know what not having a house is. I've been through all of that. And it actually taught me a few things. One of the things which it taught me tremendously is curiosity. I became incredibly curious. Why am I coming from a family which is so different? Why can't I do the same things which my colleagues are doing with their parents? And that curiosity led me to many things. Curiosity was the first step. I began learning a bit of everything because I was curious. And I got to what I would call intellectual diversity. And from that, I got to basically when you know a bit of everything, you want to assemble things and you get to creativity. And from creativity to innovation is just one last step. In my first years of life, I learned one lesson very, very importantly. It doesn't really matter where you come from. I was born again in Romania, Eastern Europe, from a family of people with disabilities, very limited means. I couldn't do the same things as others. But yet here I am in front of you on this stage. It doesn't matter where you come from. But I want to talk a bit about what I, do, what I do today. But in order to talk about that, I will need your help. So I want to do a small exercise with you first. Can you please, everybody, stand up? Let's do a very quick one-minute exercise. Good, one minute. If you're wearing glasses, take them off. Take off your glasses. No need for them. Put them, put them somewhere. Good. Can everybody raise your left hand? The other left, please. <laughs> Good. Now, with your left hand, perfectly cover your eyes. Nobody is allowed to see in this room. Nobody. Good? Great. Now let's do something simple. Try to shake hands with somebody next to you. Okay, it's working. Now, keep your hand there. I, I, don't, I don't want anybody to see anything. Keep your hand on, on your face. Everybody's blindfolded. Can you try to get off your seat to the hallway between the seats without looking? Come on, let's see that. Not enough space for this, but let's try, let's try. At least it's amusing for me. Okay, let's stop for one second. Let's stop. The funny pack to the left. Come on, guys, stop. Okay, not enough room to do this, but take your hand off. Let's go back to our seats, but do not sit. Do not sit. Before you sit, please take your glasses first, and then you can sit. Good. Now, I love doing this funny little exercise, but it's an unfortunate reality to 300 million people in the world who, do not, who have severe visual impairment or cannot see. So for 300 million people, if I would have took them to the room and they were not paying attention, they wouldn't have known how to get out of it. And we built something to help them. But let me tell you about the problem more. 300 million people are visually impaired and it's growing a lot. They use the same two solutions for their mobility for thousands of years, the guide dog and the white cane. Now, the guide dog is a great solution, but last year we spent 500 million euros to train just 2,000 guide dogs. You can do the mathematics, 200,000 plus euros for a guide dog. It is not scalable. In the entire world, only 28,000 guide dogs to 300 million visually impaired users. This is not scalable. 
but we built something which is, and I want to show a video of it. This is a 70-year-old person putting our device for the first time um, in his life for like first minute, blind since birth, 70 plus years. So what's he wearing? We call them the glasses for the blind. They replicate what the guide dog for the blind does. So a guide dog works by pulling your hand, avoiding you from obstacles, keeps you on the sidewalk, etc. The glasses, as we call them, they do the same thing, but they do not pull your hand as the guide dog, they actually pull your head. You actually feel on your forehead how, they, how we guide them by pulling the head to go around obstacles and to be safe. Now, this is a self-driving car. Everything that Tesla is doing in their self-driving cars, we also do in ours in order to guide people. So not wheels on the ground, but guide people on the pedestrian world. It is the most advanced wearable in the world. And I want to do something pretty unique here. Who of you wants to test this live? Come on, raise your hands. Who wants to, be, to actually test? But I want to add one more thing. You must speak very good English. Okay, gentlemen over here, let's do the following thing. My colleague over there, please go to her. She will train you in five minutes hops. Pay a lot of attention. I will continue my speech while the two of you, maybe you go to the corner and enjoy a bit and you're trained, okay? There is a rule in technology. You never do a live demo, <laughs> okay? Remember that. This is what the blind people are saying. We, we are tested this with over 300 blind people and it's coming in just a few months in the market. And we get messages like this, expected something like this to be possible, but not during our lifetime. Absolutely incredible, the feedback. We had people crying and everything. And while I can talk for hours about the technology and the amazing AI behind it, because this is based on AI, I want to talk about the people behind it and what we learned creating this. I want to tell you one story. This is one of my colleagues, his name is Ciprian. I found out later his name is actually Professor Dr. Ciprian, but I never called him that way. Ciprian is an industrial designer. What does he mean? It means that this keyboard in front is pointless. He uses a pen and a paper. He draws. He designs how products should feel, look, and how to be manufactured. And when we started designing this, we realized, hey, we're going to know how to make the technology work, but we don't really know how to make it into a product. And I call him and I say, hey, do you want to do this? And he said, sure. And for the following weeks, he began uh, drawing and making a lot of, uh, of uh, sketches on how the product might look, and they were terrible. I mean, they looked cool, but it had nothing to do with something that the blind user would look. And I tell him, hey, this is crap, but if for the next week, four hours a day, you're going to be blindfolded so you can't see a thing, and the other four hours you're going to spend with a blind association, with blind people, I'll give you another shot. And he did. So he did for five days, and then he goes in the weekend, he draws like 70 more sketches, and they were incredible. He understood the problem. We selected in the team like eight of them, and then we 3D printed them, we put some weights in them, this was like three years ago. We sent them to blind individuals, and they all selected one design. And that one we have iterated like 100 plus times up to today. Now, in, uh, after we published how the device will look, that was like a few years ago, we get an email, an email from Red Dot, the biggest association of industrial design. And the email began with congratulations. That's the reason why I read it, actually. And they said, congratulations, you have been selected as one of the Red Dot best of the best. Now, what does that mean? Uh, there are 4,000 products a year which get a Red Dot award. Only 40 get a Red Dot best of the best. And half of them are usually Apple. <laughs> so we were up there with Apple. And then, at the end of the email was, you're also in the final phases for something called the Red Dot Luminary, which is that one prize, which is only given once a year, like the, the Nobel Prize of Industrial Design. And our competitors for, for that prize were, for example, Virgin Galactic with Spaceship Unity. So the rocket we just took Richard Branson to space, that was competing with us. We were 12 people back then in Romania, where I'm from. And in November 2021, 
we found out that the best industrial design in the world was actually made in Romania because we won it. Thank you. Now, that told me, this experience told me two things. Number one, Ciprian knows how to open a champagne bottle. <laughs> and number two, this award means that Ciprian is one of the best industrial designers in the world. That's what this award meant basically for him. And that's when I realized something. Ciprian was always one of the best industrial designers in the world, but he never knew. He never had the right context to prove how good he is. And that's when I realized something very important. What's our role as founders, as managers, as family members? Um, our role is to create that context for the people around us to do the best work of their life. And we call it ordinary people in the right context can do extraordinary deeds. But it's our job to build that context. Stories like Ciprian, probably there are tens of thousands more, even in my country, but they never had that context. And it's our job to create that context for the people around us. Now, Lumen is doing great. We have done some pretty amazing things. We have raised more money than any other pre-revenue startup in the history of my country. Um, we have some great partners. This is Jensen, the CEO and founder of NVIDIA. NVIDIA is one of our biggest partners, and we have actually presented this on stage uh, at the biggest tech show in the world, and NVIDIA GTC, where like 40 million people were watching. And in terms of the user, for example, we'll publish this video very soon. She's the first blind person in the world to go hiking on their own with no other support, without knowing the trail, without any kind of other assistance. First blind person in the world to do that, all powered by technology. And at some point, we were asking ourselves, why are we succeeding? Because we know very big companies have tried this in the past, and they haven't succeeded. But we, had, we do. And we understood why. And it actually had to do something with the first day we started this company. We started this company four years ago with only one purpose, to help people. We never cared about the money. And by not caring about the money, we raised more than anybody else. By not caring about the money, we built things which were never before possible. And it actually became our number one value. Make meaning, not money. Money will come after. It's about understanding a problem and coming with a solution which has one purpose, to help people. Because if you help people, inevitably you'll get money. Unfortunately, business is the other way. You think of the money, you come with a solution, and then the problem which you're solving. That can work, but it's not scalable. Make meaning, not money. Money will come after. So three things I wanted to tell you. Number one, it doesn't matter where you come from. I come from a family of people with disabilities. I come from very limited means, and I come from a country which is not well known, let's put it this way. Um, and here I am. It doesn't really matter where you come from. Ordinary people in the right context can do extraordinary deeds. I gave you one example, and there are 20,000 more examples. If you build that context for them, we have to create that context for the people around us to do the best work of their life. But if you want to remember one thing from everything I told you, make meaning, not money. Money will come after. Thank you. But I want you to remember one more thing, which I said. Always a bad idea to do a live demo, right? Want to try? Take off your glasses. <laughs> so what's your name? Mark. Mark, have you, have, has uh, our colleague trained you with a device? Because I have one more thing for you. Yes. OK, let's do the following. You'll put this in the front, yes. and I'll, I'll put it here in the back. Good. So usually, just to understand how difficult this is, usually it's a one-hour training, at least, which somebody has to do, yeah? He had four minutes. That is very simple, if you remember the little amount of training. If the vibration is in the center, you can walk forwards. If it's not, you stop, you turn until you find the center, right? Yes. If you fail, you're going to fall, you're going to break, <laughs> you're going to do bad things, and the worst of all, you're going to break my device, OK? Ready? Slowly, if it's in the center, you can go. If it's not in the center, you stop and you turn. Sh 
should I stop him before he falls? <laughs> you won't fall, don't worry. You know, this is not a condition you see in real life, being on something like this. We haven't taught him how to use the stairs, so unfortunately we'll have to keep him here. The device will keep spinning him around, by the way. That's what he will do. Where do you feel? Do you know where you are? Not really. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is yours. If you want to connect, that's my LinkedIn. Thank you so much.